Thank you all for joining us for the, for the William F. Buckley Jr. Program's 12th Annual Conference. My name is Kevin Shaw, and I am the president of the Buckley Program, and have the pleasure of kicking off today's afternoon uh, discussions of Milton Friedman and his monumental work, Capitalism and Freedom, on its 60th anniversary. In the past three years, we've seen proposals for wealth taxes, universal basic income, and mandated corporate board diversity from members of Congress, presidential candidates, and even the Securities and Exchange Commission. And just this past week, Congress and the Biden administration invoked a 1926 statute to shut down a rail strike by 12 unions. And Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell hinted at a slowdown in increases in the federal funds rate. As we look back on these events, Milton Friedman's capitalism and freedom seems more prescient than ever. With chapters on the role of government in a free society, the control of the money supply, and the income distribution. So we're fortunate to be joined by three distinguished scholars to discuss these and many other topics. And I hope you're all excited for what's to come today. Now, before I introduce our guests for this afternoon, I want to say a few words about the Buckley Program. The William F. Buckley Jr. Program is an organization dedicated to promoting intellectual diversity and open political discussion at Yale. We have hosted lectures, dinner seminars, firing line debates, and this annual conference every year since 2010. We have over 550 Buckley Fellows who hold a wide range of political beliefs, but they all stand united against the formation of a liberal-only echo chamber on campus. By engaging Yale students with serious conservative thought, the Buckley program has become an institution at Yale and a symbol for a more open and more representative political atmosphere. Especially at a university where the mission is the cultivation and creation of new knowledge, Buckley Fellows believe that all perspectives must be heard in good faith. You can learn more about the program and how to become a fellow on our website, buckleyprogram.com. Now for our first panel, a, titer, a titan of Western economics, why Milton Friedman still matters today. I'm glad to be joined by three experts whose work intersects closely with Dr. Friedman's. Professor Robert Barrow, Dr. Diana Forget Roth, and Professor Ted Snyder. Robert J. Barrow is the Paul M. Warburg Professor of Economics at Harvard University, a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, and a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. He has a PhD in economics from Harvard University and a BS in physics from Caltech. Professor Barrow is co-editor of Harvard's Quarterly Journal of Economics and has been president of the Western Economic Association and vice president of the American Economic Association. His research involves rare macroeconomic disasters, corporate tax reform, religion and the economy, empirical determinants of economic growth, and economic effects of public debt and budget deficits. His recent books include Religion and the Economy with Rachel McCleary, Economic Growth with Xavier Sela E. Martin, Nothing is Sacred, Economic Ideas for the New Millennium, Determinants of Economic Growth, and Getting It Right, Markets and Choices in a Free Society. Diana Frickett Roth is Director of the Center for Energy, Climate, and Environment and the Herbert and Joyce Morgan Fellow in Energy and Environmental Policy at the Heritage Foundation. She's an Oxford-educated ec economist, a frequent guest on TV and radio shows, and a columnist for Forbes. Diana worked in senior roles in the White House under Presidents Reagan, H.W. Bush, and W. Bush. She has served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Research and Technology at the U.S. Department of Transportation, Acting Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy at the, the U.S. Department of Treasury, Chief Economist at the U.S. Department of Labor, Chief of Staff at the President's Council of Economic Advisors, and Deputy Executive Secretary of the White House Domestic Policy Council. And last, but certainly not least, Edward A. Snyder is the William S. Beinecke Professor of Economics and Management at the Yale School of Management. Professor Snyder began his professional career as an economist with the U.S. Department of Justice's Antitrust Division. He earned a PhD in economics and an MA in public policy from the University of Chicago, where he took classes from Milton Friedman himself. His research and teaching are focused on industrial organization, antitrust economics, law and economics, and financial institutions. 
His recent research includes work on antitrust policy and enforcement, as well as on the development of major digital platforms. At Yale, he teaches a course, Economic Analysis of High-Tech Industries, a course that applies industrial organization concepts and valuation frameworks to high-tech industries in China, the EU, and the US. Now, we'll start by having each of our guests deliver brief opening remarks on the relevance of Milton Friedman today, and then shift into moderator and audience Q&A. We'll have mics going around from the audience, so if you have a question, please flag down Ryan or Libby at either corner of the room, and they'll get you a mic. Now, please join me in welcoming Professor Barrow, Dr. Farquhar Roth, and Professor Snyder to the Buckley Program. Okay. All right. Well, the last time I saw Milton Friedman was in the summer of 2006. Uh, George Schultz was having a party at his apartment in San Francisco, and he had many celebrity guests at this uh, party, which included Tony Blair and Gavin Newsom and a host of uh, other people. And I was talking with someone at the party, and I asked him, do you know who's the most important person in this room today? And he would look confused and said he didn't know. And I said, well, it was obviously Milton Friedman. So an obvious question is, why was Milton so great? And I think one reason for that is he was a combination of first an outstanding academic who was really unparalleled in terms of his skill at economic theory and applications. But he combined that with uh, a unique talent at popular writing and speaking and with drawing out the policy implications uh, from economic theory for uh, a variety of issues. In terms of being an academic, uh, possibly his most important contribution was a theory of the consumption function, which was published in 1957. Um, that book introduced the idea of permanent income, uh, which was a major concept in terms of thinking about uh, consumption, but it's a concept that comes up almost all the time because uh, in many cases you have to think about the difference between being something being permanent versus being temporary, and that has a major implication for the effects. Another major academic contribution was his Monetary History of the United States, uh, which was jointly written with Anna Schwartz and was published in 1963. Um, that book particularly brought out the role of money and monetary policy and economic fluctuations through the long US history, <clears throat> but with an especial fo focus on the Great Depression and the role of money in that uh, event. He also discussed a great deal the long-run effects of monetary policy on inflation. And of course, his uh, famous line about inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon is very much related to the material in the monetary history. Some of his more specific ideas were developed a bit later in his presidential address for the American Economic Association in 1967, um, the address was called The Role of Monetary Policy. Uh, it particularly argued that the real consequences of monetary changes, um, particularly for uh, economic growth and unemployment and such, involved monetary shocks that were unanticipated and related to inflation being unexpected. So the idea was that it wasn't inflation that particularly uh, interacted with real variables, but rather unexpected inflation. And that was an idea that foreshadowed the rational expectations macroeconomic revolution that Bob Lucas uh, particularly uh, led uh, in the 1970s, but it was related very much to Milton's 1967 presidential address. So in practice, in the address and elsewhere, uh, Milton favored a simple monetary rule where the uh, monetary authority would not be tinkering 
particularly with the business cycle. And often that was expressed in terms of a constant growth rate of some designated monetary aggregate. Uh, but as Milton was well aware, the efficacy of that kind of rule depended on the idea that the real demand for money, in particular the monetary aggregate that was being considered, was uh, stable. And particularly over time, it became clear that there was no stable real demand for basically any monetary aggregate. And therefore, this kind of monetary rule would not function very well. It would not lead to stability in interest rates or in inflation. So I really wonder what Milton would think about that today. I assume he would no longer favor this kind of simple monetary growth rule that he uh, advocated for a long time. Another thing I would like to ask Milton today is what he would think about the role of uh, uh, expansionary fiscal policy as a determinant of inflation, because I think it's true that particularly in response to the COVID crisis in the U.S. and elsewhere, it's the uh, uh, undisciplined fiscal reaction to that that is mainly responsible for the inflation that we've seen. And I don't think it's really the monetary activism that is primarily uh, responsible. So the adage, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, might be challenged by current events. And I would very much love to talk to Milton about that uh, uh, idea. Now, of course, we're celebrating capitalism and freedom today. Uh, I think this is the best popular economics book that's ever been written. And I read it from time to time, and I always learn something new by reading that book. It was published in 1962, but it actually was based on lectures that were delivered in 1956. Uh, so the important ideas in that book um, are very many, and they include the idea of an all-voluntary armed force, uh, the idea of privatized social security, which became quite prominent uh, much later in Chile, uh, as an example. Uh, the concept of a negative income tax, which is an efficient uh, form of welfare program. More generally, the idea of a flat rate income tax. Uh, just as an aside, I've always thought it remarkable that Massachusetts has a very efficient flat rate income tax even though it's a left-wing state in so many respects, it has this remarkably efficient income tax, which of course is being challenged currently, which would fit in with the <laughs> usual sweet. politics of Massachusetts. Yeah. He also talked about school vouchers. This is in Capitalism and Freedom. He talked about market-oriented welfare re uh, reform, uh, some of which was adopted much later by President Clinton, of all people. Uh, he talked about open capital markets, free trade, flexible exchange rates, and again, going back to monetary stability as a way of controlling inflation. Uh, so all of that and many other things is in capitalism and freedom. <clears throat> well, the next to last time that I saw Milton was also in the summer of 2006. I saw Milton and Rose walking up the steps to the Hoover Institution at uh, Stanford, and Milton seemed very preoccupied, and he immediately started saying that uh, he was uncertain about what he should be doing, because the one thing he hadn't planned for in life was living as long as he had, <laughs> which was to age 94 at the time. Um, but of course, he was still mentally sharp, and we can all just be grateful that Milton, in fact, had as long a life as he did have. Okay. Thank you, Professor Barrow. Dr. Fergret Roth. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here. Thank you so much, Kevin, for inviting me. I'm a huge admirer of Milton Friedman. My father used to talk about him frequently, and that's where I first heard about him. 
We would go for walks when I was around seven or eight or nine, and of course afterwards, and we would talk about how to reduce traffic jams on Finchley Road in London, which is one of the main arteries in London. Well, later on, when I was at Swarthmore College, uh, majoring in economics, I found that when I cited Milton Friedman, my grades would go down. <laughs> Friedman's views on inflation and the wage price spiral, or the lack of wage price spiral on inflation, got me a C plus in the first quarter of macroeconomics. I got an A minus in the second quarter when inflation and Milton Friedman were not on the menu. Well, one of the reasons that uh, Milton Friedman is so relevant today, and Professor Barrow has mentioned many of these reasons, is social responsibility and ESG. And I am indebted to Amity Schlaes, who's going to be on the next panel and who is a best-selling author on Coolidge, taxes, reasons for the Great Depression. I highly recommend all her books, by the way for pointing out to me uh, this op-ed that Milton Friedman wrote in the New York Times back in 1970. It's right here, you can probably find it online. And it's very prescient as regards ESG and the questions we're, we're facing today. He said, and I quote, what does it mean to say that the corporate executive has social responsibility in his capacity as a businessman? If this statement is not pure rhetoric, it must mean that he is to act in the same way that is not in the interests of his employers. Now, Milton Friedman did not apologize for the role of profits and the benefits that profits gave, and that's P-R-O-F-I-T-S, unlike the ones in the Bible. Friedman also said he is to make expenditures, in other words, uh, the corporate executive, he is making expenditures on reducing pollution beyond the amount that is required by law in order to contribute to the social objective of improving the environment. The corporate executive would be spending someone else's money for a general social interest. Insofar as his actions, in accord with his social responsibility, reduce returns to shareholders, he is spending their money. He is free to spend his money, but he is not free uh, to spend their money. Well. If we look at ESG, the Environmental, Social, and Government Initiative, uh, it's a leftist agenda masquerading as strategy. It advocates manipulating markets to achieve political ends. It forces companies to engage in controversial political issues, and it generally generates lower returns. It doesn't yield benefits for the environment. If we look at human rights in China, uh, slave labor used to make wind turbines and solar panels that we use here. If we look at ethanol uh, that raises prices of food all over the world. Uh, if we look at the mining damage from mining minerals that go into uh, battery-powered electric cars. If we look at high energy prices, these are not good for society. ESG is used to defund oil companies and promote renewables. Uh, and divestment from oil companies undercuts grid reliability and resilience, raising costs to those who can least afford it. ESG doesn't give higher returns and it attracts uh, capital from places that uh, do not necessarily uh, perform uh, better. It doesn't even help climate change. Climate change uh, does not threaten the financial sector. And here's another example. It doesn't help developing countries. Sri Lanka has a perfect score from ESG, 
because they decided not to use chemical fertilizers, but this resulted in a drop in crop yields, a starving population, and a change in the government. Uh, to go back uh, to some more quotations from uh, Milton Friedman, he says that, uh, let me find it. He says, the whole justification for permitting the corporate executive to be selected by the stockholders is that the executive is an agent serving the interests of his principal. This justification disappears when the corporate executive imposes taxes and spends the proceeds for social purposes. He becomes, in effect, a public employee, a civil servant, he remains in name an employee of the private enterprise. And just to conclude, the short-sightedness of these kinds of measures is exemplified in speeches by businessmen on social responsibility. This may give them kudos in the short run, but it helps to strengthen the already too prevalent view that the pursuit of profits is wicked and immoral and must be curbed and controlled by external forces. Once this view is adopted, the external forces that curb the market will not be the social consciences, however highly developed, of the pontificating executives. It will be the iron fist of government bureaucrats. And with that, uh, I would like to close. Thank you very much. So first, I would uh, like to thank Kevin and uh, his compatriots, uh, Ryan and others, for the invitation to be on this panel uh, and to offer some remarks about Milton Friedman. Uh, it's great to see Robert Barrow after, I don't know, many decades and, and get a chance to meet Diana. My, my two bottom lines are, number one, uh, Milton Friedman is highly relevant today, and two, he's greatly missed. And consistent with Robert's comments, I think there's a, a fundamental uh, point about Milton that explains why he, his work is still so highly relevant and why he's so missed, and that's his ability to teach uh, and explain. Um, I actually uh, joined uh, 63 other students back in the fall of 1975 when I went to the University of Chicago to pursue a PhD in economics. And uh, the advice given to all of us was to take Milton Friedman's price theory course, two quarters, fall and, and winter, and then do that and then take the same course with Gary Becker in winter and spring. Um, it was good advice. And I just... For those of you who have ever seen this before, a lot of Milton's work on price theory was rightly overshadowed by his work in many other areas, but his, his treatise on price theory, microeconomics, is quite amazing, and the fact that I still have it on my shelf, I guess, at least says something about that. Um, by the way, when, when one of us was answering a question and we were off track, Milton's standard response was, excuse me, let's go slow. <laughs> that meant you were off track. And, and he was going to very carefully explain where you went off track. And when I teach now, I, I, I think of Milton all the time. I mean, when he won the Nobel Prize and he was asked a lot about how does he apply economics, one of, the, one of his comments was, well, economists have, have two tools that are very important. Oh, really? What, what professor? Uh, we have supply and we have demand. <laughs> He's right on target. So Kevin already covered, Robert already covered the range of issues that uh, Milton addressed as a public intellectual, leveraging his ability to teach and explain. But uh, I jotted down several that have nothing to do with monetary policy. Um, should we have a military draft or a volunteer army? Should we legalize drugs? Should we have a negative income tax? Uh, 
Uh, should we have liberal immigration policies? Uh, should we restrain or expand the role of government? And, and I, you know, his record uh, certainly isn't uh, 100%, but he won a lot. And his wins, I think, are obviously durable. Uh, next year, we will celebrate 50 years of no conscription in the United States, and instead of voluntary army. Um, so I don't think there should be any debate about his uh, ongoing relevance. Um, of course, he would be vexed and frustrated by the expanded role of government, its reach, its influence, its command of, of resources. But I still would say, compared to other economists whom I've uh, studied and, and gotten to know, he is the person who I think has been really unmatched in his ability to influence public policy. By the way, very different from other Chicago figures. Uh, if you ever really want to have a lot of fun, read the transcript when George Stigler won the Nobel Prize and was invited by President Reagan to uh, offer some comments, and George ended up saying, well, in 1982, well, I'm sorry, but we're, we're sort of in a depression. He got yanked off the stage at the White House faster than a you know, bad vaudeville, vaudeville act. Um, but uh, you know, another area that Diana touched on um, that he, where he remains so relevant is, of course, his stance on the role of business in society. And uh, just last Sunday in the New York Times, there was a story on management education, two, two references to, to Friedman as the cornerstone for the view that the, prim the primacy, about the primacy of uh, stakeholders and in, in, uh, what, what businesses should be concerned about. Of course, that view is, is criticized almost unrelentingly but I think in a very shallow way, I'd be happy to talk, give my views later on that. Um, let me just turn to my main other point. I think he's greatly missed. And I'll just pick up on, on, on the topic that Diana introduced, which is pollution, or maybe more broadly, climate change. Um, Diana already covered what's the role of business given policy, and I agree with what she said. There remains, however, the question of, well, how should governments address climate change? And I, I don't know what Milton would say. I, I, I wish he were here to explain his views. Um, no doubt he would have been well aware of the problems of organizing a carbon tax, especially given his colleagues George Stigler's uh, insights about cheating uh, when it comes to coordination but when I think about whether he would prefer that and all the challenges of, a, of coordinating a carbon tax and uh, enforcing it with trade controls, I think he would prefer that over what we have now. What we have now is the commissars in charge. We, we are not relying on the price system. We're not relying on markets. And if you want evidence, I would say look back on The Economist magazine last month, November 6th. The cover was 1.5 degrees centigrade gone. That refers to the global goal of reducing the increase in temperatures to 1.5 centigrade. And you read the leader and you read the briefing. It's fascinating. There's no mention of prices. There's no mention of a carbon tax. It's all about government's investment, investing in a variety of mechanisms to get carbon reduced and to get electronic vehicles increased. Um, if, if, if Milton were presented with those two alternatives, I'm pretty sure he would favor the price system with uh, a carbon tax, even if it was leaky and not implemented perfectly. Why? Because he believed in individual decision making. He, he believed that individuals do better than governments. Um, 
and I'll just, I'll just close with one of my favorite quotes. Government can never duplicate the variety and diversity of individual action. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'll ask one question, and then I think we'll open it up because I sense that there's a few around the audience. Um, one topic that we've discussed in all of your opening remarks is the increasing, expanding role of government in free society. And one of Milton Friedman's arguments in Capitalism and Freedom, in broad strokes, is that increasing government intervention, continual government intervention, can be destabilizing. With the COVID-19 pandemic, with the Green New Deal, and many legislations surrounding these two issues, do you find that Milton Friedman was right on these issues, that the CARES Act and the Payment Protection Program were actually destabilizing for the economy? Or do you think that Milton Friedman needs an update here? You can go in any order, so. <laughs> Well, one thing I would say is this famous line about never letting a good crisis go to waste, and the COVID crisis is certainly an example of that in terms of uh, particularly leading to an expansion uh, of government intervention. And then the question is whether that ends up being permanent or temporary. And there does seem to be a tendency for the uh, response to crises to lead to policy uh, uh, expansion that lasts uh, perhaps forever, or at least for a long time. And I think you saw that in the past. If you look at the Great Depression and the response to that, if you look at the world wars, particularly World War uh, II, and then the COVID uh, case is another example of that. Um, so I would guess that Milton would be quite dis disturbed by their reactions. And as I mentioned before, uh, this would be true particularly on the fiscal side. And the concern that this will be another permanent expansion of the size of government. Uh. Yeah, uh, yes, can everyone hear me? Yes, well, I, I mean, I certainly agree that the expansion in terms of the Green New Deal uh, has been harmful without any gain to the United States. And I would just like to um, ask um, all of you, uh, I just want to say there was, there's been 50 million spent on electric charging stations in the state of Alaska. Do any of you know how many battery-powered electric vehicles there are in the state of Alaska? Would anyone like to guess? Does anyone know? Anyone want to guess? Uh, a little more than two. Yeah, yeah. 316. Uh, there's actually uh, about 1,200. There's 1,200 registered battery electric vehicles. 50 million, it's about $45,000 per vehicle. And the reason there are few battery powered electric vehicles in Alaska is because it's very cold and the battery drains down and you have even shorter range than otherwise. And the transportation department is spending equivalent amounts of money in uh, other states, uh, particularly Minnesota, North Dakota, uh, South Dakota, Wyoming, where it's also very cold. And this is just a pure uh, pure waste of money because uh, until technology catches up, which I think is going to be a very long time, uh, this is not going to be useful uh, to anybody. And there are many uh, other examples. And I'd like to take the opportunity uh, to talk about Dean Snyder's uh, view of the carbon tax. If we had a carbon tax here in the United States and we reduced emissions here in the United States, uh, there would still be massive emissions coming from China, Russia, developing countries. So it would not make any difference to total global climate emissions. In fact, it would drive our energy intensive industries offshore. Uh, in lesser regulated uh, countries. So there would be, in fact, more global emissions. So I agree that the price system needs to work and that that's the right way of looking at things. But until we have an entire global price system, uh, then having a price system just in the United States 
will be costing us trillions of dollars to no gain in reduced emissions and possibly increased global emissions as our manufacturing moves offshore. And it's kind of the same with the required battery-powered electric vehicles. Uh, the batteries are being made in China, uh, made from coal-fired power plants. They have to be shipped over here. They then have to be disposed of. Meanwhile, we have a lot of clean uh, uh, gasoline-powered vehicles are getting cleaner every day uh, with hybrids and with more efficient vehicles. So it's a very, very complicated system. But now I can turn it over to uh, Dean Snyder to reply. So, Kevin, your question's really interesting, and, and uh, Robert Barrow's comment about how, how government influence changes over time, I think, is, is, is also very interesting. What we see are government influence here, and then something happens, and governments intervene. And we get this step function up, but we don't get the step function down. <laughs> and the, the, the potential for destabilization is that the value of being in control of government goes up, <laughs> because government's more powerful. And, and I think therein lies the potential argument for the destabilizing um, effects that, that your question uh, talked about. I mean, you look at the US, how, how fractious it is, Brazil. Imagine how it would, the, would, it would be still fractious, but I doubt that the stakes would be as high and the competition would be so severe and so nasty if government was not as big. And uh, as to uh, carbon tax, yeah, I mean, I, I uh, of course, am not advocating a uh, U.S.-only carbon tax. I, Diana, you and I agree on that. Mm -hmm. it's, right. it's the question of, are we going to have all of this government-directed investment in lieu of a carbon tax that would be more global? If, if we can't get a more global carbon tax, we're basically screwed. Um, because I don't think the government approach is going to work. And I, th I would agree with you on the uh, a really good example is the lithium batteries. What we see now are as the demand for EVs increases, we're getting all this mining of lithium that's not very good. And what, when you mine lithium that's poor grade lithium, it takes two or three times as much carbon to refine it. So I mean, it's just, this is without a price system, we're never gonna get the millions of decisions that need to be made uh, done in a way that would be forwarding of the objective. Well, with, with uh, capitalism, and this book is Capitalism and Freedom, as people get better off, they demand cleaner air and cleaner water. And we see this in the United States. We've seen it also in China. Residents of Beijing notice the announcements put out by the US Embassy as to the cleanliness of the air in Beijing. They also want cleaner air, and they put political pressure on their governments. So a more capitalist society, better off population, is going to result in clean water and clean air. And uh, one of uh, a very eminent economist, Larry Summers, who always speaks the truth and sometimes does not get credit for it, once <laughs> said that it benefits Papua New Guinea to have more copper smelting because it's a poor country and it needs those revenues. And I think he was roundly condemned for saying so, but it's absolutely right. It's a poor country, needs those revenues. But as Papua New Guinea's residents get better off, they're not going to have the copper smelting, just like China isn't accepting our recycling anymore because they don't want our trash anymore. They're richer, they don't have to. So capitalism, I think, is the solution to uh, these di dirty air and dirty water and emissions that none of us like. I just wanted to say something about a carbon tax, which is a more general question. What do you think about a relatively efficient form of tax, such as a carbon tax, versus an alternative uh, with an array of cumbersome and inefficient government regulations. Now, you might immediately think the efficient tax would be preferable, but it's really not that obvious, because uh, an efficient tax is very powerful. 
And if you control that, you can do a lot of mischief as well as a lot of good. Whereas if you're doing stuff that involves a lot of cumbersome intervention, it's kind of naturally limiting as to how much trouble you can create with that kind of policy. <clears throat> this is true more generally if you think about a value-added tax, which is the most efficient uh, sort of large-scale uh, form of raising government revenue. And then the question has always been, do you want to have that in the United States, uh, which is one of the few countries that doesn't have that form of tax? Well, it's not obvious uh, because the efficient tax is offset by the fact that it uh, produces a, a very strong tendency toward raising the scope of government. Mm -hmm. When you have an efficient tax to raise the revenue to provide for the government, uh, and I think carbon tax is somewhat analogous to the value-added tax in this kind of calculus. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, if you have a question, please raise your hand, and we'll get a mic over to you. The gentleman down in the front, Brian. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mike, I, I wonder why there's a default position on, on the, from, the, from, the, from the panel on the taxation uh, associated with the, the carbon uh, uh, the carbon emissions and not incentives with tax breaks. Uh, it, it seems to me that each tax that's passed, every regulation, further interferes with the market. And is it not more efficient to give them incentives on their own, to incentives to, to uh, uh, fiscal incentives to uh, be more efficient carbon-wise and otherwise, rather than to oppose these taxes. You, uh, it seemed to me that you were conflating, uh, 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 Professor Barrow, uh, the, the issue of raising uh, government funds versus incentivizing clean air. And I, I understand that the two are sort of connected, but which, which, is, the more, which is the higher priority? I mean, I think the first idea behind a carbon tax is not per se to raise government revenue, although it certainly has that uh, dimension. I mean, it's a tax associated with Pagu, who uh, proposed the idea of uh, putting a levy on something that has uh, external costs that are not internalized by the ordinary market mechanism. Uh, so I don't think there's anything wrong with that in terms of uh, providing the right incentive. Uh, if it's true that uh, the, the carbon has this dimension of this uh, external cost uh, for society in terms of uh, global warming or other features, then I think it's correct. You can design a tax that will provide the correct incentives not to, not to do that. Um, you may or may not at the same time raise a good deal of revenue uh, there, but the revenue dimension there, I think, is much more secondary compared to that from the value-added tax, where it's a much larger amount of revenue that you're talking about and can be the central uh, basis of government revenue, in, uh, as it is in many countries. So I think that the carbon tax is uh, regressive. It falls much more strongly on low-income people than upper income people. Someone in the bottom fifth of the income distribution in a household spends approximately 25% of his or her income on electricity and motor fuels, compared with 4% for people in the top fifth. It has different geographic burdens. People in cities do not spend as much as people in rural areas. Uh, it's difficult to implement because everyone wants a car route. Uh, there are serious border adjustment problems because you find that your own goods are subject to the carbon tax, whereas goods coming in are not necessarily subject. And it's difficult to estimate how much carbon is used to produce all these different imports. And many people say it's against WTO regulations to be taxing imports on the basis of their carbon content. So I would be against a carbon tax. I would say in terms of tax breaks that everybody should be treated the same. We have a domestic production tax credit, so write-offs of dry wells are kind of equivalent to write-offs of a pharmaceutical product that doesn't work. Someone who's tried a pharmaceutical product, invested in it, and it doesn't work, they get to write that off. 
uh, the tax breaks we have right now for renewable energy go way above uh, tax breaks for conventional fuels. And there are vast benefits for conventional fuels. If people in developing countries would have more nuclear power, more coal-fired coal -fired power plants, more natural gas, they would be able to have running water, electricity, things we take for granted here, not to mention uh, hot showers, large refrigerators, cars where you could drive to the supermarket, put your week's worth of groceries in and put them in your large refrigerator. There are great benefits, and many people talk about the social costs of carbon. There's also social benefits of carbon that I think are vastly understated. This is why I said I wish Milton were here. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know what he would do about this. Um, I think there are two issues that have been surfaced. One is what, what happens to the revenues, and does that cause more problems? And then the other is, could you really get coordination around a global carbon tax? And, you know, I, I think there, there's a very strong argument against that. Um, you would need very complicated trade controls. Diana just sort of alluded to that. Otherwise, you're going to get stronger incentives. The more effect that the carbon tax has, the stronger the incentives for some countries to deviate. So it would be a tall order, and the, the tall order is one that we should be skeptical that anybody could actually execute. And I'm, if we want to do something on carbon, maybe Secretary Kerry, who I've talked to him about this, maybe they should just try to focus on not digging coal out of the ground and using that. And that would, you would probably get some benefit of coordination among a small number of countries on one dimension, but we don't have that. So I share the, the, uh, the view that it would be really hard to do a global carbon tax. But, and here's why I think Milton would, here's where I think Milton would come out. And Diana, I, I have to use your Alaska example against you. That's an example of the commissars doing something that's really stupid. And now we're basically, it's the only policy game in town to have governments make these decisions. I would rather have those decisions distributed among individual firms, individual households, rather than put those decisions in the hands of the commissars. Right, well part of the problem is that we have no ceiling for the budget now. There used to be the Budget Act, Graham Rudman Hollings. I mean, Congress used to have some kind of ceiling. Now they're just throwing out money at whatever they want to do, which is a fundamental problem. And as for taking coal completely off the table, I mean, we can't even get China to agree to halt increasing its coal-fired power plants until 2030. And coal is also important in the United States. If we took coal out of our energy mix right now, the reliability of the grid would be vastly diminished. But our coal is actually cleaner than Chinese coal, and China would like to import our coal. They would like to buy our coal. But because of ESG, we cannot get our Western ports to ship it to China. So our coal producers in Wyoming cannot ship their clean coal to China, which would in fact reduce global emissions. Why don't we go to this side in the aisle? Thank you. Um, following on Ms. Frithgott Ross's brilliant uh, litany of very failed policies being implemented in the names of Green Earth and ESG, my question is is this? How much of this is explained by a broken incentive structure, namely that the commissars making these policies really don't have any skin in the game and don't bear any of the burdens of when these decisions go very, very badly? And insofar as that's the case, is there any remedy for that? Well, I think that uh, that's an excellent question. They don't bear uh, any, uh, any of the burden, but I think, uh, again, Capitalism freedom. Capitalism is going to solve this because as people become aware that these ESG funds have lower returns, uh, they are going to be moving their own funds out of them. And energy companies have done very, very well this year, even though they are anti, they're not on the ESG list. So I think that we're going to find that um, the winners, people want to go with the winning team. 
I think that's going to be the ultimate solution. It's an interesting question whether ESG funds would really have lower returns. What you'd expect is that when this was introduced, it would reduce the price, the value of it. But from there on out, you'd expect the returns to be similar. I wouldn't think that uh, there would be systematically the case that you'd get poorer returns uh, as a typical investor. Well, there's a University of Chicago study that shows that they have a, a higher influx of funds but lower returns. And I can show you the study. Yeah, I have a hard time understanding that. <laughs> What's the time frame of the study? Like over how long <clears throat> without returns calculated? Yeah, I'd have to look into that directly. Okay. All right, well, why don't we take another question? Let's get a student. Um, how about Frank in the back? And apologize, uh, apologizing for everybody that doesn't have the time to ask a question. This is a great panel. Um, hi, everybody. Frank from School of Management here at Yale. As somebody who studied economics in Western Michigan and then Brown, and now becoming a consultant at SOM, I can attest to the fact that Milton Friedman's ideas live and breathe amongst our schooling. The problem is when we go outside of econ and management to the other social sciences. Taking a class in anthropology or sociology, Marx lives very, very much these days. And the mere mention of capitalism without pejorative adjectives, you know, gains you the sneer and reject public, reject of even faculty members. So how, the question is to ask, how can we in attendance here help spread the message outside of these confines where we have the safety of expressing our opinions? How can we convince the other social scientists, whether they be faculty, business leaders, and the such, that these ideas matter? Thank you. <laughs> Professor Snyder, do you want to start us off? Sorry, I just put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope you have. You're the Yaley, so. <laughs> oh, so right. So I, I think your observation that um, at least in the U.S., in many societies now, business is bad. I mean, capitalism is bad, business is bad. For a while there, it was tech was okay, that was exceptional, now tech's bad. And then, then I think the only thing that's still good are, you know, mom and pop grocery stores. You know, it's just, so I think, I think you're right on target with, the, you know, what's the sentiment. And I don't know, I, I hope it won't be we have to live through um, serfdom to l relearn this. I mean, you, know, you think back on, on China, and you know, I've been to China a lot, and people in China revere Milton Friedman. Um, but why? It's because they experienced the depths of socialism. And then Deng Xiaoping came and um, you know, a lot of people were, were lifted out of poverty. But I, I just don't know how that lesson gets learned. I think your question goes, how can it be learned in an everyday sense? And um, all we can do is have discussions like this and, and uh, be a good teacher. Um, it's hard. Well, I'd like to give the example of the Federalist Society, which um, started about 50 years ago, and it was founded by people, uh, including someone from Yale, uh, David McIntosh. It started out very small in many schools, and it grew and grew and grew, and its annual meetings in Washington, D.C. in November at the Mayflower Hotel are sold out. Its dinner at Union Station is now sold out. So here we have the William Buckley Jr. program at Yale. I would suggest that it be spread to other campuses, that you have an annual meeting in Washington, that you get together with other people, and then if there were a Supreme Court of Economists, you might find that you have many believers in Milton Friedman on that Supreme Court of Economists. Now, of course, there's not a Supreme Court of Economists, but uh, there are people in management who are the equivalent in your fields as Supreme Court justices are to the law. And you would find these representatives rising up to those positions. 
So you have to start small, and I would encourage Kevin uh, to try and spread the society to other schools so that all of you can get together, learn from each other, and um, encourage each other also so that you're not the only ones in a room saying the things that you're saying. Well, I can recount one personal experience in terms of the uh, influence uh, that Milton had, uh, for example, on teaching programs. Uh, so long ago, I was a PhD student at uh, Harvard, and they treated Milton completely with ridicule. They thought his views on uh, monetary policy were absurd, uh, macroeconomics more generally, and also the material that had to do with applied microeconomics and related policies. Um, so it took me a while. I mean, I was coming from physics. I didn't know much about economics. It took me a while to understand that my professors at Harvard at the time didn't really know what they were talking about. <laughs> and that they were incorrect about Milton and about many other things. And certainly there's been a dramatic change in terms of the extent of the appreciation for Milton at various campuses, in particular outside of Chicago. And um, years later, he would have been treated with much more respect and appreciation even at Harvard. And certainly that's true even now in terms of his uh, uh, major work, such as his theory of the consumption function, which I uh, mentioned earlier. I think we have time for two more questions. So how about over there on the, uh, the, the fellow with the black blazer? So if we're to assume that a carbon tax isn't passed, that there's no direct government, either mandate or incentive for private companies to prioritize or try to make their companies green. And we're also to assume that ESGs are a bad thing. That seems to be a general consensus in this room. And what's the incentive for a private company to actually work towards making their government or their company reduce their carbon output or working towards green uh, sustainable policies? Because if a CEO privately acting on behalf of the company with his own interests is doing bad things with an ESG, for instance, not uh, upholding the, his duty as the CEO to his shareholders, then what can a private company do? What makes a private company do that? Uh, people demand lower emissions and cleaner air, cleaner water. So a company that has, for example, uh, a waste runoff in a river these days does not look very good here in the United States. Uh, companies have reputational values that they are anxious to preserve. There's also basic regulations about what companies are allowed to do and what they're not. Third, we have technology here that has dramatically reduced emissions. We haven't signed, the United States didn't sign the Kyoto Agreement, didn't sign the Paris Accords, but our emissions have gone steadily uh, lower because of the use of natural gas uh, phasing out coal, the substitution of coal for natural gas. A substitution of natural gas for coal. So we're using more natural gas because our technology has found that. Again, it comes down to capitalism. Capitalism has resulted in these decreases of emissions, not because any CEO has decided that he or she wants cleaner air. Well, I'm basically a free market person, but if you have a situation with important externalities, for example, uh, when I was in high school in Los Angeles, there was major problems with air pollution, most of which was coming from uh, automobile emissions at the time. And it's quite clear that the individual producers uh, for, of automobiles didn't have the proper incentive to uh, curb those uh, emissions because they weren't really uh, paying for the damages that they were causing. I mean. I don't think you can just depend on the fact that people like companies that are cleaner. Uh, I think that's a legitimate case of a market failure where you need some kind of intervention that looks like uh, Peguvian taxes, uh, um, 
the treatment of auto emissions, which was a real clear uh, external effect, actually, I think, worked out pretty well in terms of the nature of, of the government interventions that were carried out, whether in California or elsewhere. Um, but I don't think you can just rely on capitalism in cases like that. I don't think that actually works in theory or in practice. Wouldn't you say, though, that people like to live in areas that are cleaner? So people didn't like to live in Pittsburgh when it was a big steel city, and now that Pittsburgh is completely cleaned up and it's a center of technology, relatively emissions-free, um, people like to live there. So it's in these governments' interest to provide an attractive area to attract people to live in it because that gives them a higher tax revenue. Well, but you brought in the government there. I mean, I, I completely accept that people like clean air whether it's Pittsburgh or Los Angeles or whatever. But that's not the same as saying that you have the right individual incentives uh, when you're the producer of something, whether it's automobiles or steel or, or whatever, to curb the emissions in a way that's going to conform with the desires of people with respect to clean air. Uh, th the market isn't going to work completely effectively when uh, uh, the individuals involved uh, aren't really bearing uh, the costs at the margin associated with the activities that they're carrying out. Um, so you brought in the case of a government in Pittsburgh having some incentive to do something. But that would look like uh, something analogous to a, a tax on activity in some area that's going to uh, have the effect of curbing the uh, uh, particular emissions and therefore cleaning up the air in, in, in some environment. It may or may not be a localized situation, which uh, a localized uh, situation will call for a different form of intervention from something that's more global, which is what the current climate change stuff is uh, uh, focused on. So that's different from more localized uh, air pollution, for example. So. It could, uh, I'd like to respond to go back to the question. I think that, you know, what, what are the incentives of businesses to address this issue? With a, with a carbon tax, if, if a business is getting energy from a coal-fired plant, they're going to be faced with a higher energy bill because the tax would be higher because coal is more carbon intensive than natural gas. They would have an incentive to decide if they had a, had uh, a way of reducing their energy use. So that's that's the idea of the carbon tax, and that would be stronger than in the case where they were getting their energy from a natural gas plant. It's, it's you know it's distributed um, calculus. Now the other reason, the other incentive, and the only one that I feel comfortable with, I don't I don't like the uh, pressure to just try to do good things. I think the right way to think about the, the New York Times article that Milton authored is that if, you're, if the parties with whom the company is in contract want the company to do something good, they will accept lower wages, lower returns, or as customers, they will pay more and the question of who is bearing the cost of doing something good, it's not, just, it's not outside the company, it's within the company, and the, sh and the managers have an incentive to take into account the preferences of investors, customers, and employees. I think those are the only two valid bases for managers to do what some people would say is the right thing. We have a very mobile society, and we see many instances of people voting with their feet, leaving areas that are overregulated, high taxes, uh, and also dirty, in favor of places that are more pleasant. And uh, that gives uh, governments, and yes, I admit there is a role of government, it gives governments an incentive to try to attract uh, industries that are going to also encourage people to settle in those areas because they want the tax revenue from those individuals. One of the things that Milton wanted was less government but also distributed government and competition among governments. And I think that's what, what Diana's point is. 
Well, this was a lovely discussion, and thank you all for joining us. It's clear that there's a lot more to be discussed, so thankfully we have two more panels after this. So.